I'd like to welcome you all to the Newman Center. And, um, you know, uh, it's really kind of fun. I invited all these nuns to come, and they're all here. <laughs> so the level of spirituality of this place is you can feel. The, the, it's soaring, right? But uh, at any rate, uh, I, I'd just like to welcome you all and uh, begin with a short prayer. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many things, for our friends, for our families, for our community. We pray that we may grow always in love in our hearts. And we pray that as we focus on the spirituality of Pope Francis, that he may motivate us to live ever deeper Christian lives, spreading your love and your goodness, especially to those who are broken. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome, and I'd just like to briefly uh, introduce our speakers, who I just met the other day. But uh, uh, really, uh, I think we're going to have a wonderful uh, uh, sessions here. First of all, Father Andy Alexander, who's a Jesuit, is a native of Omaha, Nebraska, and he attended St. John's Great School there and graduated from Creighton Pap Prep in 1966. He entered the Society of Jesus in, uh, at that same year, and he studied at St. Louis University where he received a master's degree in Ignatian spirituality. He taught at St. Francis High School on the Rosebud Reservation and at Red Cloud Indian School on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and uh, where he was assistant principal for discipline. <laughs> oh, I remember those people from high school. Yes. But he's a nice guy. He's mellowed since then. Uh, <laughs> And Andy later, later studied uh, theology at Regis College in Toronto, where he became a good friend of the current mayor of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> only, only kidding, but, um, but it's interesting. We were there at the same time. I, I was working in a parish, and one of his classmates was a good friend of mine. So it's interesting how these, uh, these little connections come up. Uh, after ordination, Andy was the director of vocations for the Wisconsin province of the Jesuits. He then served as assistant provincial and director of formation for the Wisconsin province and was the pastor of the Jesuit-sponsored Jesu Parish in Milwaukee before coming to Creighton in 1996. Currently, he's vice president for the university ministry and the director of collaborative ministry uh, office at Creighton, supporting faculty and staff, contributing to the Jesuit and Catholic identity of Creighton University. He's uh, also the co-creator of the online ministries website, which receives over 21 million hits a year from around the world. And he's the uh, co-author of two books, Praying Lent and Retreat in the Real World, and the Real of World. And uh, we have some of those books in the back. Uh, the Sisters of uh, St. Paul, the Daughters of St. Paul are here, some of my favorite people. And uh, they're going to be, they've got some books back there. And also afterwards, uh, we're going to have a, a little, uh, you know, refreshments. Uh, so we have a little bit of time together. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, introduce Maureen, Maureen McCann Waldron, uh, who's the Associate Director of the uh, Collaborative Ministry Office since 1997. Uh, she's, uh, she has a wonderful family and is a grandmother, which makes her very, very proud. And she's a native of the East Coast. And uh, it's really funny, uh, the two of us both grew up in Philadelphia, so, and, uh, but she's younger than I am, <laughs> much younger than I am. And uh, she graduated in 1971 from John Carroll High School in suburban Philadelphia, and, uh, and then Creighton University in 1975 with a degree in journalism, and spent uh, the next of, uh, most of the next 20 years in corporate public relations in Omaha. Returned to Creighton in the 90s, and completed a master's degree in Christian spirituality in 1998. So, uh, you know, it, it's really wonderful. Uh, the two of them are going to be reflecting on the spirituality of Pope Francis, who I think has really kind of reanimated a lot of us uh, with, a, with a degree of excitement. So I would like to introduce, let's welcome them in a very special way.
Uh, yes, thank you very much. Father Jack and I were, uh, went to high school just a few miles and a few years apart. <laughs> and uh, we sort of rediscovered our Philadelphia roots. And I left Philadelphia and went to Creighton University, and I have been in Omaha ever since. Um, we are so privileged to be here. This is just a wonderful experience for us. We're very grateful. We're grateful for the spirit of the invitation that uh, we got from, from Father Jack and from the committee, Renee Evans and Sister Patty Chang and uh, Sharon Shirucci. And we're, oh, and Lynn, and I'm so sorry, I just met Lynn tonight. I don't know where Lynn is, but that's right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are really grateful for our time of preparation. We've been working on this for some time now and reading about the life of the people of the Newman Center and the parish. We've been reading your bulletins, Father Jack's wonderful letters every week, and been really inspired by your vision, your mission, your self-study that you've been doing. And we're really grateful uh, for the openness to make this retreat you know, for, with us and uh, to make this opening for Creighton alumni and for Creighton parents who are also here tonight and for uh, people from other parishes and of course the sisters. So welcome all. We are a community of faith. Many of us have roots in the Ignatian tradition and we are a church community, community that's being renewed by Vatican II and now we were renewed once, we're being renewed again by Pope Francis. And it's sort of a wonderful experience. And over these three nights, we will reflect and pray with the graces that Pope Francis is calling us to. It's rooted in the gospel, and it's rooted in an Ignatian vision and a personal relationship with Jesus. And we'll look at what it offers for that personal relationship for us, for our lives, for the service that we do for others, and what we do with others. From the moment Pope Francis stepped out on that balcony, we were moved. Jorge Mario Bergoglio. We were, I remember, uh, scrambling, looking for the um, internet to say, who is this person? And then we hear he picks the name Francis, and for a while we weren't even sure which Francis. But then he made a smile when he made the comment about how the cardinals went to the ends of the earth to pick a pope. And then he did that incredible thing of asking us to pray for him and bowed. And I don't know about you, but I had tears running down my cheeks wondering what this might mean for us. I don't think any of us could have imagined what would happen in the days ahead. He started doing things that were signs of who he was going to be for us. He was the first Latin American pope. He had Italian roots. He was from a religious order often suspect. <laughs> it was clear that he was going to be pastoral and humble, and it even seemed he was going to be quite challenging. What we'd like to do tonight is to take some themes that have emerged from his messages to us and explore them in terms of the gospel and do this in a way that will help us pray in the days ahead. After Pope Benedict resigned, the speculation was that the new pope was going to be one of really two cardinals who had been front runners in the speculation, both of whom had worked on communio, 
uh, with um, Cardinal Ratzinger after the council. It, it was a fairly conservative journal that was founded to correct some of the imprudent writings after the council. One of those cardinals was appointed the head of the bishops and the other was Archbishop of Milan where several other popes had come from. So we were imagining that that's what might have happened. But in the congregation that precedes the conclave, bishops get up and cardinals get up and say things that indicate what we need. And a number of writers indicated that they're usually cautious and try not to say anything that might offend whoever's going to be the future pope. Cardinal Bergoglio gets up and says to the cardinals that the church must be less self-referential. He used an old image in the history of the church, the mystery of the moon, to describe what he meant. This image refers to that sense that the moon has no light of its own. It gets its light from the sun. And that the church should only reflect the light of Christ. Here's what Francis said to those cardinals. When the church is self-referential, inadvertently, she believes she has her own light. She ceases to be the mysterium lunae, the mystery of the moon, and gives way to that very serious evil, spiritual worldliness. I have to confess I never heard those two words put together. Spiritual worldliness. He concluded his remarks to the cardinals with these words. To simplify, there are two images of the church. The evangelizing church that goes out from itself, that of the church that devoutly, devoutly listens to and faithfully proclaims the word of God, or the worldly church that lives in itself, of itself, for itself. This should illuminate the possible changes and reforms to be realized for the salvation of souls. And this is the man they elected. After the election, Francis told reporters who were asking him how he chose the name Francis, that as the voting was beginning to look like he was going to be elected, the cardinal next to him from Brazil whispered to him, don't forget the poor. Francis said, right away, with regard to the poor, I thought of St. Francis of Assisi. Then I thought of war. Francis loved peace, and that's how the name came to me. Then he told the reporters, oh, how I long for a poor church, a church for the poor. I imagine that coming in second, as some people say in the last election, he must have gone back to Argentina and prayed about what he might have done had he been elected pope. As a new post, he rode the bus back to the house with the other cardinals when they had the limo ready for him. He paid his bill. He called his friend from the newspaper stand in Buenos Aires to cancel his subscription. <laughs> using a telephone in his apartment. We're told it's the first time the Pope had a telephone. He decided to live in the Casa Santa Marta apartments rather than the newly renovated apostolic palace. He turned away from elaborate vestments. I'll never forget that image at uh, Good Friday when he's about to do the Stations of the Cross. You know, the Pope carries this big wooden cross 
around the Colosseum, and he did the opening prayer, and some assistant comes over with this big cape to put on his shoulders, and he goes like this. He waved the guy off. He carries his own bag when he gets on a plane. But on Holy Thursday night, Pope Francis went to a detention center for youth in Rome for the Mass of the Last Supper. He washed the feet not only of some women, but of non-Christians. He told priests that night that they are to be shepherds. And like shepherds, they must begin to smell like their sheep <laughs> because they are so close to them. He told the apostolic nuncios who were gathering in Rome to congratulate him that the church must be a church of bridges, not walls. Saying their most important duty in selecting bishops in each country, it's the apostolic nuncio that helps in the process of selecting bishops, was to select pastors, not princes. He used the word princes. And he said, not climbing careerists. Priests who are, quote, humble and merciful servants. On other occasions, he says, shocking and exciting things, challenging the trappings of the Vatican's courtly life. He told bishops and clergy that they were to be servants. He put a German bishop on a leave of absence after the bishop was challenged by his own priests for building an extravagant residence. He took his time reappointing the Vatican officials, the heads of the congregations, he replaced the Secretary of State and promised to reform the Vatican finances. And he used two words that scared the Mafia to death, transparency and integrity. He appointed eight cardinals to be his special advisors in reforming the Vatican. Overnight, establishing a collegial form of governance in the church only envisioned by Vatican II. He gives daily homilies in the chapel there at Casa Santa Marta, and he speaks about focusing our relationship on Jesus. He talks about the gaze of Jesus, about becoming less selfish, about getting outside of ourselves as individuals and as a church, about being less divided, about our mission to the margins, to the frontiers, to those farthest away to whom Jesus embraces. He tells us in many ways that we must not be a small church, a pure church, but we must be a bigger, more inclusive church. In one of his homilies, Pope Francis said that when Christianity becomes an ideology rather than a faith based on a relationship with God, its followers become proud and rigid. He said an ide ideology is about ideas. It's about a plan. It's not about a relationship. To quote him, he said, Jesus isn't there, nor is his tenderness love and meekness and ideologies are always rigid always ideological christians are rigid moralists ethicists but without goodness ideologues close the door to faith with all their rules francis said the key that opens the door of faith is prayer I'm not talking about praying, not saying prayers, because the Pharisees recited many prayers in public simply to be seen. Jesus warned his disciples not to follow their example because prayer should be a heart-to-heart -heart meeting with the Lord. 
Pope Francis tells us in a number of ways that Christians can't be gloomy or gossipy. He uses those words a lot. He tells us we can't be rose water Christians or painted Christians. We need to be authentic and credible. We need to be joyful and to be full of faith in the Paschal mystery. He told the people at Assisi that St. Francis' spirituality was not saccharine. It wasn't sweet, but it was full of peace. And he said that the Pavarello, the little poor one, St. Francis' call came from gazing at Jesus on the cross. His open eyes, the love of Jesus on the cross that guided him in his mission to rebuild the church. Pope Francis makes headlines around the world with simple phrases which signal so many things naturally, simply taking us back to the gospel. Who am I to judge? Atheists are embraced by God's mercy. We must renew and deepen our understanding of the role of women in the church. We must find ways to reach out to people who are divorced and he called a synod on marriage, divorce, and the remarried. Pope Francis told the youth at World Youth Day that they're called to push back against the tide of our culture. He told them that they and the elderly, along with the poor, are on the margins of our society. He said the youth must be advocates to transform our society. He said they must go back to their dioceses and be heard. Make noise, he said. In an interview for the Jesuit Journal that went around the world, the reporter asked Pope Francis, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And of course, his famous reply is, I am a sinner. On his coat of arms from when he was ordained a bishop, which is now his papal coat of arms, are the words that describe his calling. To be, his calling to become a member of the Society of Jesus, it's from a description of the call of St. Matthew, and he talks about the Caravaggio painting that he loved to go in and contemplate. But the words are, Miserando atque elegendo, mercying and calling. In the call of Matthew the tax collector, Jesus sees Matthew by having mercy on him and by calling him. The Pope made mercy a verb, mercying and calling. Pope Francis was touched by the way Jesus sees Matthew the sinner. He sees Matthew with affection and with love. And at the same time, he sees him with mercy and sees him as a companion with him in service. Jesus has mercy and calls with the same loving gaze. Pope Francis' spirituality was steeped in the spirituality of Ignatius' spiritual exercises, which begin with a personal experience of God's merciful love and call to us. Tonight, we're going to spend some time reflecting on how Jesus sees us. And we're going to let him gaze on us with affection and with love. Let me reflect on a gospel that is often called the gospel, the pardon of the sinful woman. It's in all four gospels. A woman anoints Jesus with the entire contents of a vessel of very expensive perfume. In Mark and Matthew's gospel, she pours it on his feet. In John and Luke, uh, she, excuse me, Mark and Matthew, she puts it on his head. 
and in Luke and John, she anoints his feet. We all know Luke's version of the story. Jesus was invited by Simon the Pharisee to his house for dinner. He was reclining on a couch by this low banquet table and a woman came in, a well-known sinful woman. She knelt behind him at the table and she took his feet and kissed them and washed them by crying on them and she dried his feet with her hair. Then she put very expensive perfume on his feet. Well, the eyebrows of the Pharisees kind of shoot up at this. But Jesus points out to his host that the host had not welcomed him in the traditional proper way, and she was making up for it. Then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's look at this gospel for a few minutes. Now there was a sinful woman in the city who learned that he was at table in the house of the Pharisee. We have already set ourselves up as separate from the sinful woman. She doesn't even have a name. All we know is that she's sinful. Most of us assume what is not said in the gospel is that she was either an adulteress or a prostitute. All Luke really tells us is that she's known as a sinner. What if the most astonishing part of this story is that she's just like us? Pope Francis said very simply and honestly, I am a sinner. I'm not that brave. The rest of us pretend that we have our act together. Our sins are well hidden. I know mine are. I don't rob banks. I don't commit adultery. But that does not make me less sinful than Pope Francis or the woman at Simon's banquet. I'm just not as unguarded as they are. I work a lot to make sure I look good all the time. Me, a sinner? <laughs> well, you don't see me being impatient with my family at 9 p.m. or cranky with my kids or judgmental of other people or the fact that I ignore the poor. I wish I wasn't like this, but I am sometimes. And with Pope Francis, I really can say I am a sinner. So let's look at this sinful woman in the gospel. Why is she coming and throwing herself at Jesus' feet? What happened to make her so grateful? Scholars say that we're probably only hearing the second half of this event. Many people had probably already heard Jesus speak. Simon the Pharisee would have heard him speak in town as well as the other religious leaders at the banquet. And the woman, she probably heard him too. The Pharisee, for the Pharisees, they threw banquets like this. This was not unusual whenever a religious leader or a teacher came to town. So most likely, Simon the Pharisee had heard Jesus speak and invited him to dinner for some conversation along with religious leaders. So Simon invites Jesus for a banquet and honor. In that society, these banquets were not behind closed doors. Now here in Hawaii, this is a little easier for you to look, think about because all of these doors in this room are open in November. And in Nebraska, they would not be. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> so it sounds odd to us, but people from the town would wander into the room and stand behind the banquet table. Of course, they wouldn't have eaten. They didn't have any stature. But they wanted to crowd in and, and listen to the conversation, and that was acceptable. But this woman came into the room, and I think she had heard Jesus speak. She saw him. She heard him. 
Maybe she got to know him, but she believed his message. When she first heard Jesus speak, her heart must have stopped. He wasn't hanging around with the Pharisees a lot. He was more with the fringe elements of society, the tax collectors, the poor people, the sinners, and he treated them so kindly. He was so encouraging. He gave them such a message of hope for a better life, for the sense that they are deeply loved by the Father. It was the poor and the sinners who heard this message as good news. He presents God as a loving Father who gave them hope. It was the Pharisees who did not like what he said. What would it have been like when this woman first encountered Jesus? She probably would have hung at the edge of the crowd. She would, wouldn't have wanted to attract attention. Was she there when he healed a blind man? Did she watch him invite himself to Zacchaeus' home for dinner? The tax collector? Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to come to your house for dinner, to the tax collector's house. Had she heard him say, blessed are the poor in spirit? Had she heard him say, it is mercy I desire, not sacrifice? Or had he just looked her in the eye, meeting her gaze and smiling at her with love? No one had ever looked at her with love. Everyone looked at her with judgment. Jesus smiled at her, and he loved her, and she was transformed by it. And it was that encounter with Jesus. He looked at her with love, and he recognized her as a person worthy of love. And she felt so different, like her life was changed somehow. And in the days ever since she had heard him speak, she's been really feeling that grow in her heart. And now she has to do something. She has to let him know that she's heard him. So she does it in this wordless way. She simply kissed his feet. I think it was probably as remarkable a scene back then as it would be today. But I can picture, I can feel the electricity in the room when the sinful woman walks into this banquet looking at the floor and heading straight for Jesus. Her heart was so full of gratitude. She believed him when he gave her a message of hope. She had to thank him because her life would never be the same. Bringing an alabaster flask of ointment, she stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with ointment. If somebody comes to our house today, we welcome them. We take their coat, well, maybe <laughs> in Nebraska we take coats. You give them a lay. <laughs> you ask them to sit down. Those are the basics of hospitality. In Jesus' time, hospitality was just as important. You would welcome him with a kiss, and because Jesus was a teacher, even more importantly, you would anoint his head with olive oil, and you wash the dust off his feet. These were people who were walking on dusty roads all the time. You always washed their feet. Simon had so little regard for Jesus, this young teacher, he did not even offer him the most basic hospitality. But Jesus ignored the insult. He stayed, and then the woman comes in. 
she could see that his feet had not been washed. And as she bent over to kiss them, her tears were flowing down. Her tears of gratitude were coming down all over his feet. She didn't plan this. She didn't have a towel. She didn't really have a plan. But she had her hair. For a woman to unbind her hair, to let her hair down in public, was unheard of. A woman's hair would only be unbound in front of her husband. But in this incredibly vulnerable act, she took down her hair and she wiped the tears off his feet with her hair. And then instead of the usual olive oil, she anointed his, his feet with perfume. She was breaking every social norm to appear at this banquet, and already she knows she would not be wanted there. No one wanted her. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of a woman this is who's touching him that she is a sinner. And the Pharisee said to himself, any time in the Gospels you have someone saying something to themselves and not out loud, it's going to be a judgment. Probably about someone else, but this time it's about Jesus. It certainly is almost always words that they're afraid to say out loud. He's not judging the sinful woman, not just the sinful woman. He judges her always. But this time he's judging Jesus. I thought he was a prophet. I thought he'd be important or I wouldn't have put up the time to put this banquet together. I wouldn't have invited him. And now look who follows him here. She's a sinner and he doesn't know it. <clears throat> what we often miss in the gospel are those. Simon is thinking this. And then in the gospel it says, Jesus said to him in reply, Simon the Pharisee had thought these things, but Jesus knew what he was thinking and he said out loud in reply. And then Jesus tells the parable. So Jesus tells Simon and the others around the table the story. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor. One owed 500 days wages, the other owed 50. Neither one of them can pay, so he forgives them both. Which one of them will love him more? Simon might have even thought this was a trick question. He's a little hesitant when he answers. He said, the one, I suppose, whose larger debt was forgiven. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Jesus turns and looks at the woman who is behind him, sitting, crying over his feet. But he's speaking to Simon across the table. He said, do you see this woman? No, Simon had not seen this woman. He had seen some sinner, someone who didn't have a name, who had interrupted his dinner with guests, who had made a scene. Then Jesus pointed out what she was doing what Simon, his host, had neglected. A kiss at the door, the anointing of the head with oil, washing of feet. So this lowly woman came in and did it. And she did it so humbly. She sobbed over his feet. She knew what her sins were. And she understood that Jesus was someone who would accept her as a sinner and who would love her. Jesus was someone whose life was not about the rich and famous. His life was for the poor and the forgotten. And now this woman's awareness of her own sin carves out in her a greater capacity for love. So I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. 
but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He looks around the room at the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They're quite confident. They haven't sinned. They don't break laws. But they're arrogant. They're judgmental. They ignore the poor. They embrace every honor and privilege available to them without giving anything back. But they don't think of those as sins. And quite often, we don't either. We judge other people. We wonder about their parenting. How could they possibly vote that way? What kind of a marriage do they really have? And it makes us feel just a little superior. We don't sin, not really. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. The others at the table said to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This sinful woman has come to Jesus. She has reached out and touched him. She has overcome her fears about what this might mean for her life. Would we do that? If I knew that Jesus was having dinner tonight at a very nice house up at Kahala, I don't think I'd have the nerve to go there on the back patio. Even if Jesus was sitting out there, I wouldn't want to be embarrassed. I wouldn't want to look bad. I don't want to put myself in a place where Jesus, where people are going to judge me, unless they're going to judge me as being wonderful. But this woman was willing to do that because her struggles are much bigger than mine. Her sin, which might not be bigger than mine, is at least more public than mine. And she trusts that Jesus is going to help her. For me and probably the rest of us, we don't rely on Jesus the same way. We don't trust Jesus like that. I have a great life. I have a wonderful husband, good kids. They're off on their own. I have that grandchild that Father Jack mentioned. I have a good job. So I run my life pretending that I'm in charge. And too often I say in prayer, all is well here, God, I'll let you know if I need you. <laughs> the biggest difference between this woman and me is that she knows deep in her heart that she needs Jesus in her life in a very real way. And she is willing to drop herself at the feet of Jesus and show him that she is grateful for his love and his forgiveness. The rest of us might hold back a little. She throws herself at his feet, painfully aware of how humiliating this is, in front of everyone. But it is her chance to thank Jesus. She is so grateful for his tender forgiveness of her. And Ignatius always says, Saint Ignatius says, grateful people are generous people. She has been forgiven many sins, and because of that, she is showing great love. Her faith has saved her, saved her. We might not pay that much attention to our faith. I mean, we never miss mass, we're involved in church, but do we really believe our faith will save us? She did. Our faith is easy in some ways. We were talking about this over the weekend. Unlike some parts of the world, no one is going to shoot at us if we go to church. No one's going to harm us. And more likely, people are going to look up to us a little because we go to church. But how much does our faith mean in our lives? We might be really more distracted about Thanksgiving dinner next week than Advent that starts three days after that. But we can start right now. We can believe that God is saying to each one of us, as he did to the sinful woman, let me love you, 
Let me forgive you. Let my love make a difference in your life. Pope Francis says about this gospel that the woman felt understood, loved, and she responded by a gesture of love. She let herself be touched by God's mercy. She obtained forgiveness and she started a new life. And when he talked about this gospel, Pope Francis was really, he seemed to be overwhelmed by it, by the love and mercy of God. And he wanted people to feel it, to really feel it. And he finished by saying, God, the living one is merciful. Do you agree? Let's say it together. God, the living one is merciful. And Francis led them saying, all together now, God, the living one is merciful. Once again, God, the living one is merciful. Tonight, and in our relationship with the Lord throughout the day tomorrow, we want to let Jesus look upon us with loving mercy and a loving call. The night before he died, Jesus said that he was giving us one commandment, to love one another the way God loves us. I've often wondered why we don't do that. I think it's because we don't know how much he loves us. We're too often like the Pharisee who obey all the rules. The Pharisees are the letter of the law people. When Jesus said, your holiness has to surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees, that's a really hard thing to understand what he means because they do everything right. How could you be more holy than do everything right? What they lacked was mercy. And what they lacked is a sense of God's love for them first. Psalm 116 says, what return can I make to the Lord for all God's love for me. It's only when we get to that place where we're overwhelmed with God's love that we're ready for a response in love. And that's what Pope Francis is taking us to first and foremost is a sense of God's love for us because we're called to be a community that loves the same way. This is where we start. This is how we live. This is what our mission is. Miserando atque eligendo. Mercying and calling is the way Jesus gazed on St. Matthew. For Ignatius, prayer always begins with several preludes. We place ourselves in the presence of God and collect, recollect, recollect the context of who we are and who God is. And when we have connected in that sense, really connected with our God, Ignatius asks us to pray for the grace we desire. Prayer is a relationship with God. When Paul says pray always, what he means is be in a relationship with God always. He's not talking about saying prayers always. A husband and a wife knows how to do this. They're in a relationship all the time, whether they're communicating all the time or even whether they're in the same place at the same time. Of course, there's times in the day when they're not very conscious of that relationship and Unfortunately, there's times when they might not even be very faithful to that relationship in little ways or big ways. At times, there's great tenderness, togetherness, communication, intimacy. 
our relationship with God is like that. There's certainly times when there are great moments of intimacy. But the trouble is, we have to work at the moments in which we have this relationship in the background of our everyday life. That we place it in that place in the background where I usually have an argument, a worry, an anxiety, something troubling me. Pope Francis has said to us many times that prayer is not saying prayers, but being close to our Lord. So tonight what we'd like to do to begin this <coughs> retreat, this journey from and journey to, is to name the desire we have to know Jesus' love for us. It's an unconditional love. He doesn't love us if or when. He doesn't love us because we get our act together. He loves us because we don't have our act together. He loves us because we need his love. He loves us because we need his love. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. So to help us with this grace of the spirit of Pope Francis's call, let's ask for the grace to experience his mercy and call tonight, to experience ourselves as he sees us. I like to think of a house. All of us have a house. It's really pretty on the outside. We have flowers, we make sure it looks nice. And we probably have a nice entryway and it's very welcoming and we bring people into the house, into a living room that's very nice and decorated in ways that represent who we are and what we say. And there's deeper parts of the house that are more intimate that we bring friends and family in and even more deeply, there's places in the house that might be a little messier and where you can let your hair down. But every house has got a basement or an attic or a storeroom. That's where we have the stuff that's from the past. Maybe the stuff that's broken, doesn't fit, isn't presentable. And the mystery of letting the Lord love us is to let the Lord take us into our own basement. Turn on the light, show us around, and love us there. Everybody loves what's beautiful about us. Everybody loves what's staged or presentable or what we present as ourselves. Sometimes, we don't even want to relate to the Lord because we're embarrassed. Or we think that if I relate to the Lord honestly and openly, the Lord's going to ask me to change, to be different. And I've tried that. We get into that sense that we want a relationship, but it's painful, embarrassing, uncomfortable. And the good news is to let the Lord mercy and call us is not only what frees us, it's what allows us to be his disciples and to let the world know what kind of Lord we have. The reason the scribes and Pharisees didn't like Jesus is they didn't like his message. Who followed him? Who loved him, who hung on his every word. Messy people, sinners, sick people, tax collectors, prostitutes. The religious people didn't like him. The religious people didn't like him. When you are part of a spirituality that says God rewards the good and punishes the evil, 
you can actually tell who's good and who's bad. The people that look rewarded are good. The people that aren't doing so well are bad. That's a heck of a system to maintain. God rewards the good. God punishes the evil. That's not the way Jesus presented his father. He presented his father as loving us all. And that's what Francis is saying to us so clearly, so fundamentally. God loves us all, even sinners, especially sinners. And when we get there in our own heart, feeling loved, feeling accepted, feeling embraced, the way this woman felt it, something's going to be different in our church. That's what comes first. To let the Lord mercy us and call us. Tonight, we can feel our attraction to this kind of love. We can let ourselves say, I want to know that, what that woman felt. We might have resisted it in the past. We might have had some experience of it in the past, but it might even feel distance, distant from us now. So we can ask for it. Lord, reveal me to myself. Jean Vanier, the founder of L'Arche, uh, communities of uh, mentally handicapped persons and those who are aware of their own handicaps, said, God reveals himself to us by revealing us to ourselves. When we realize our own fundamental unreliability, then and only then we know our need for a savior. Before then, I don't need saving. I can work it out, I'm doing okay. But when we know we need a savior, and when we encounter that there's a savior there who loves me just the way I am, then you get grateful people. And grateful people are generous. Tonight and tomorrow, we can ask for the grace to grow in this experience of being a love sinner. We can say, Lord, let me grow in my desire to thank you, like that woman at Simon's house. Let me desire to love others the same way, looking on them with mercy. We ask this with hope, with expected hope, with confidence and trust. And it's so clear this is what the Lord wants to give us. When you think about it, if we ask the Lord for what the Lord wants to give us, it works. The trouble is we're often asking for stuff we don't need and stuff that isn't good for us. Pope Francis says that it's all about remembering. The memory of God's love and mercy he says it's like blowing on embers to keep the fire alive in our hearts. Tonight and throughout this retreat, let's use Francis's image of blowing on the embers to let this memory of God's love for us grow. Father Jack mentioned my granddaughter Charlotte. She is 10 months old. I think she's a prodigy because she started toddling around a little bit this week. I think she's a genius. I mean, I think it's pretty apparent. Uh, and yesterday, Father Andy and I are driving down Dole Street, Dole Avenue, and I get a video from my daughter on my iPhone. And here is Charlotte, before I left, I got a text on Thursday when I was packing and she said, Mom, she just took six steps by herself 
And I couldn't go over and see her, and I said, she's going to be running when I get home in a week. But I got a text, and here in the text is a 30-second video, which I'll be happy to show every 10 minutes <laughs> afterwards. And she is walking, and she is toddling all around the room. And I was so thrilled. I've probably watched it seven times. And I sent it to my sister-in-law in Chicago. And I sent it, our son already had it in St. Louis, and my sisters in Oregon have it. And we were all so thrilled. We we're all texting back and forth. Isn't this wonderful? Now, that may sound like just a gratuitous mention of Charlotte, because I wanted to work that in somehow. But really, <laughs> really, when I thought about it, we are so delighted, everyone from Oregon to Hawaii to Omaha to Chicago, we are thrilled. We are delighted in Charlotte and this wonderful, wonderfulness that she is. And I think that's how delighted God is in us. And I think that kind of unbridled delight in each one of us is who, is what we don't always see, what we don't feel. What if we take now a little time for some quiet time to rest in the presence of Jesus who loves us, who takes delight in us? Let's take some time for prayer. We'll spend a minute or so to let ourselves feel that we are with him here. We might listen to Jesus say the words from Isaiah 43 to us several times. You can just repeat it. You are precious in my eyes, and I love you. And, you know, I have called you by name. Use your name. He would say to me, Maureen, you are precious in my eyes, and I love you. Jim, you are precious in my eyes. Put your own name in there. Then let's spend about five minutes just enjoying that freeing, unburdening, wonderful experience of being loved by Jesus, of having nothing to hide, of going into the basement, as Father Andy said, with a light, the things we'd rather not look at. We have nothing to hold on to. We can let go of all of our wounds and all of our fears. Jesus and Ignatius both talk about the evil spirit who might want us to worry or think of objections or wrestle with problems. We might be distracted by the voice of the Pharisees who judge Jesus for having a good time, eating and drinking with sinners. We might hear that voice of the judgmental older son who refused to come in and celebrate with his loving father who was so full of joy that his son had returned. That's thinking. That, that's using our brain. For this prayer, we use our hearts. We're going to let go of that constant spinning in our brain. We're going to open our hearts. The Holy Spirit of Jesus and the Father simply want us to receive this gift of unconditional love. And when we have felt like we've really been enjoying this time of affection with Jesus, we'll take one final minute to put our gratitude into words. This is just the time for us to say thank you in, in our own words, however we want to say it. And we will come back for the final part in about six or seven minutes. Thank you. We welcome you to join us tomorrow evening and feel free, uh, and Wednesday evening, feel free to bring a friend. Tomorrow night we will explore more deeply how Pope Francis and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and the Gospel invite us to give more of ourselves, to become more outside of ourselves. 
we are forgiven, we are freed, that we might be chosen for mission. Wednesday night, we'll explore how Pope Francis calls us to be church, not only for each other in this community, but for the world. Whether you can join us the next two nights for prayer or not, please pray for all the people in this room who are experiencing this retreat. Please, especially Father Andy and I, ask for your prayers. And pl let's pray that the grace of these nights might be a blessing for us as individuals, for our families, for our parishes, for those who are coming from other parishes, for our church, and for our world. Tomorrow night, during the day, tomorrow, tomorrow and during the day, tomorrow, tonight, let's really try and stay connected with our loving God, the God who delights in us. When we go to bed tonight, let's express gratitude and let's tell God what our desires are for tomorrow. And when we get up and we're having that first cup of coffee, in the shower, going to work, whatever we're doing during the day tomorrow, in the background of the day, let's keep this desire with us. Lord, open my heart. Let me feel how precious I am in your, in your eyes. Let me feel how loved I am. And just have that rest in our background. It's like that song in your head. Let's let these thoughts be part of our day and our relationship with God tomorrow. Let's be grateful people and let's let that go deeper, what we experience tonight. And remember throughout the day that we are forgiven and we are chosen to be with Jesus and with others. Sometimes it can be really difficult to spend five minutes with the Lord. We might feel wounded. We might be angry. We might just have a lot in our minds and in our hearts. The key is not to give up, to find those moments, as Maureen said, tomorrow while I'm in the shower, getting dressed, going to work, doing the ordinary things of life, to just let it wash over me. What we heard tonight, what snuck in to a place that it needed to get, something that softened me, something that encouraged me, something that gave me hope. And perhaps we're going to have a reception now and, and get to be with each other. Let's try to tell each other things. I enjoyed hearing that. I found that hopeful. This is really good. To try to feel like a community that's not just blessed individually, but together. And so as a sign to uh, do that and get us to the reception, let's share the peace of Christ with one another.